this morning. With that in mind, what Jesus said in our Bible reading there in Luke chapter 10, that there were many prophets in verse 24 that wanted to see, and kings that desired to see what the disciples saw. I want to talk to you today about what the disciples saw relating to the cross and what Jesus is doing on that cross. As we continue our study of the elements of worship, one of the elements that is present at our worship service on the first day of every week is the Lord's Supper. And I realize that some folks do not celebrate this. Some, uh, some Christians do not necessarily celebrate this every first day of the week. Um, but I'll explain why we do. And this is one of those reasons why the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter uh uh, one, uh, chapter 10 and in verse 25 says neglect not the assembly of thyselves together as the manner of some is. Uh, one of those reasons is this particular element of our worship service and that's the, that is the Lord's Supper. While you've got your Bibles open let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, oftentimes I will read this while I'm waiting on the Lord's table. And I suppose that part of it is out of habit. But part of it is because this is one of the most conclusive, uh, 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 most conclusive writings that has been done on the Lord's Supper and how it is to be conducted that we find in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul writes to the Christians at Corinth, and he begins this topic in, let's begin in verse 17. I'm sorry, I've got 16 uh, as the beginning, but it, I want to begin in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. I want you to pause there just for a moment. As the Christians at Corinth were coming together, it was not beneficial. It was destructive for them. Paul said their coming together to worship God was not as God intended. He says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church. Now, of course, this is the Greek word, ekklesia, the called out. This is when they assembled together as the church. And in the context, we're looking at worship service. He says, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. Paul began this entire letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, talking about the divisions that existed in the church. And I find it ironic that Paul begins talking about the Lord's Supper by talking about divisions. It's very important that we pay close attention to that because the Lord's Supper is a unity issue. It is a unifying factor, and we'll look at that a little bit later on. Paul continues on, where there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. In other words, it's not the Passover as Jesus was keeping it. He says, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What I say to you, shall I commend you in this? I will not. The, one of the issues that was going on apparently in Corinth along with the divisions was that the Christians were uh, coming from a pagan aspect, a pagan reality, is that they believed that they were assembling together to eat basically as Jesus and his disciples a, a meal. And they were incorporating communion in that meal. And one of the reasons that we don't have meals uh, in the church building, but rather potlucks at homes, is this very passage that when we come together as the church, we are to come together to worship God. 
We assemble together as the church to worship God. And part of that worship is what we refer to as communion. I'm going to use that term communion because I prefer that term over the Lord's Supper because that was the issue that the Christians of Corinth were having. They did not recognize this as a communion. They were looking at it simply as a meal, and they referred to it as the Lord's Supper. Um, sometimes this is referred to as a, a feast. 1 Corinthians 23, which is where I usually begin when I'm waiting on the Lord's table, says this. Paul says, for I received from the Lord. Very important there. Paul received this from God. What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this, notice this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new, notice this, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance, again, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Right there, Paul is telling us what the essence of this is. Paul is telling us that every time that we partake of these emblems, every time we take of the bread, every time we drink of the cup, we are proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ, and we are remembering that death. You may have noticed the songs that we sang this morning were songs that we would typically sing in uh, as a communion song to put us into mindset for partaking of these emblems. Paul continues on here. There's more. Oftentimes, I will stop there when I'm waiting on the Lord's table, but Paul continues on. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. This is very serious. Will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Someone who comes in and takes of this in a manner that is unpleasing to God is guilty of crucifying Christ. Let a person, Paul says, examine himself, then so eat the bread and drink the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, without understanding what these represent, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But we are judged by the Lord. We are disciplined. So we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, brothers, when you come to eat, together to eat, wait. Some of your translations will say tarry for one another. I believe this is important that the entire congregation assemble together. This is something that is to be done together. So much so that Paul says, if someone is absent, wait for one another. I've told you some of this before, but when I was in Alaska, something that amazed me is that, and I'm always, I've always viewed myself as being pretty punctual. I've laxed a little bit in my, as I've aged. But one thing that I've always tried to do is watch the clock. And... When I was in Alaska, something that amazed me. Services began, worship service began at, I think it was 1030. My, and, I, and I can't remember the, the exact time, but let's say 1030. We sat there and, you know, visited, waited. 1030 came, 1030 went, 1045. At about 1050, that someone got up and, and made announcements and they said, well, we've, we've all assembled together now. And the reason they were waiting is 
that someone hadn't shown up yet. What they, their custom is because of the severeness of the weather in the region is that they will wait until every family unit is accounted for because they want, number one, they want everyone to be there. And number two, if someone is out in what they call the bush and, and there's snow on the ground and they have an accident, they will leave that building and they will go find that individual. When the Bible says to wait for one another, tarry for one another, Jesus and Paul are putting emphasis on the need for everyone to be present, to participate together in the Lord's Supper. He says then, goes on, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about other things. I will give directions when I come. So this is this kind of sets the stage for our study this morning, the element of worship. Again, I cannot emphasize enough what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 10 and 25, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. This is so important. Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper. Now, I can't stand here and tell you that this is the most important facet of our worship service because God does not place more or less emphasis on any one element of worship than another. But I do have to say that remembering Jesus is paramount. If you want to look back at Matthew chapter 26, very briefly, we will refer back here, so you may want to put a, a, uh, a marker in 1 Corinthians or in Matthew chapter 26. But in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He set it up. This was his, uh, his commandment, his example, his pattern in which we are to follow. And Paul's reference here that he had received this from the Lord follows perfectly with what Jesus himself did. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 now, of course, they were keeping the, the uh, Passover of the Jews, which we will look at, which uh, the Passover was a forerunner to communion. Jesus, uh, or Matthew says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So I think this, again, this, this sets what Jesus uh, set up to be observed. The Lord's Supper or communion is a pattern that was observed by early Christians on the first day of every week. Acts 20 and verse 7, we see a pattern that the disciples gathered together to break bread. Let's go back there for a moment. And again, this is simply a pattern that tells us what the habit of New Testament Christians was. And so we have determined that this pattern is something that we also should follow today. Acts chapter 20 and in verse uh, 7, on the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread. And that breaking of bread is in reference to the Lord's Supper. Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day and prolonged his speech until midnight. Now some some of my kids think I'm an awful long-winded preacher, but this does not compare to what the Apostle Paul might have done. Now we don't know exactly what time they assembled together. Historians tell us that in a lot of instances the Christians would assemble together 
on Sunday evenings. After the working day was complete, Sunday was not a holiday at this point in time. So maybe Paul's speech only lasted for four or five hours. It doesn't say they started at 10 o'clock or 10.30 in the morning and lasted until midnight. But it is remarkable enough that Luke sees worthy to note the length of the time in his writings. But this is the pattern. This is the the what this tells us that the Christians assembled together upon that first day of the week and they partook of communion. Again, the forerunner of communion was the Passover. And for time's sake, well, let's go ahead. It, it is important. Let's look back at the book of Exodus, chapter 12, when the Passover first comes about in Jewish history. Passover was the largest, most, perhaps most important holiday uh, in all of Jewish history. It, it was a day of observance, and it was a day in which they were to remember. And in that, it parallels our remembering Jesus. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And the household is too small for a lamb then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. I want you to notice this, a perfect sacrifice. A lamb without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. So the selection is to take place on the 10th. They're to keep it for four days. And when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost. And on the lintels of the house they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with... Notice this in particular, it comes into the element, unleavened bread. Now we know later on as Moses is giving more instructions about the leavening, that all leavening had to be removed from the houses. And so we know that when Jesus took the bread that he took on the Passover feast, when he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that bread was unleavened. There would have been no leavening in the house. It says, and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roasted with its head and legs and inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I, for I, notice this, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike down, strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for your houses, where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, Steve asked several times when he was with us that we sing a song, when I see the blood. And the theme of that song is, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. That blood of that lamb symbolized the blood of Jesus that was to come. 
It symbolized what we partake of when we partake of communion, the fruit of the vine, reminding us of the blood of Jesus. He says, And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Friends, I don't think that we realize that we are continuing that. We are continuing that memorial forever. We don't realize sometimes that it was looking ahead unto Jesus. The perfect sacrifice, the Passover lamb. And I don't think that we realize what Jesus did for us. When I see the blood, when God sees the blood, He passed over us. I want us to look a little bit deeper into the purpose of communion. The word communion itself means the sharing or exchange of intimate thoughts, feelings, especially when the change, the exchange is on a spiritual level. What we are doing when we partake of this Lord's Supper, when we partake of communion, we are exchanging not only with God, not only with Jesus, but we are communing with each other. We're partaking of this. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, I, I think that this perhaps cannot be emphasized enough. This is a unifying factor. This is to bring all Christians into perfect harmony, one with another, as with Jesus as the center focal point. Remember what it represents, and remember as we partake of it, Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and in verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I find it interesting. He begins this paragraph. Flee from idolatry. Idolatry, an idol is anything that comes between us and God. Maybe it is something very simple. Maybe it's the house needs clean this morning then house cleaning has become your idol. Maybe it is something more important than house cleaning. Maybe it is I have an obligation to meet. And that obligation has become an idol. It has severed our relationship. We should be together. He says, therefore, my beloved Flee from idols. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not, now some of your translations will say, a communion in the blood of Christ. My Bible, my English Standard Version says, is it not a participation? Just as the Israelites took the blood of the Lamb and painted the doorpost over here, we have casing on the doors. They painted the doorpost. They painted the lintels with the blood. They participated. Christianity is not for one who sits on the sidelines. Christianity is something that we must participate in. We have to be engaged in. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? When we partake of that bread, we take part in Jesus' sacrifice. 
Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifice participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That the food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything. Goes, Paul goes into idols there. No, I imply the pagan sacrifices they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to, to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, he says. The cup of the Lord, the fruit of the vine, participation in the blood of Christ. Paul says you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? He says, do you think you can change God's mind? Do you think that God is going to come running after you? Seeking you when you forsake the assembly? When you fail to take part, to participate in Jesus? No. No, God is not going to come running after you. He's not going to become jealous of you. He's already done that. He sent his son. At the same time that we are participating in Jesus' blood, this brings this congregation together in unity. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You see the, the flow of this. Paul begins talking about idols and the participation in chapter 10. Then he talks about the participation with Jesus in the bottom half of chapter 10. Then in chapter 11, he talks about the Lord's Supper and how they were to do it, to conduct themselves. And then over here in chapter 12 and in verse 12, Paul talks about the unity of the local body of believers through this act of communion. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. What this does is it binds us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Another purpose of communion is a time of self-examination. Now, my wife very jokingly, and perhaps I shouldn't even say this, she said, I thought that it was a time to struggle with the children to try to keep them quiet. And yes, small children are a struggle. And yes, small children are a challenge to keep quiet. But why do we keep them quiet during communion? We keep them quiet so that each person participating has the opportunity to examine themselves spiritually. First Corinthians chapter 11, we read this a moment ago. I want to re-examine that, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Do you want to crucify Christ? You think about what Judas did. Judas himself, as he betrayed Jesus, 
could not live with his own conscience. But rather went out and hanged himself. Because he was guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. Let us examine ourselves. Let a person examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning. In other words, if we do not, if that did, if it fails to remind us, if the bread fails to remind us of the body of Christ as it hung on the cross. If the blood fails to remind us that Jesus died for our sins, then we are not discerning the Lord's body. And we are eating and drinking judgment. Or I think the King James Version says damnation on ourselves. We are condemning ourselves. Communion is a mental exercise remembering our faults. We talk about self-examination. It is, it, is, it is an opportunity for us to remember our faults, failings, and our personal sins. And it is an opportunity to remember that Jesus paid for those sins. Matthew chapter 26 for a moment, if you'll go back there. Matthew chapter 26, and this time in verse 28, I want to see what Jesus says here. Matthew chapter 26, and in verse 28, Jesus says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said that his blood was being poured out. Under the old covenant, they had what was called a drink offering. Paul, at the end of his life, referred to himself as a drink offer, being poured out. Jesus' life was poured out for us. It was poured out so that we might remember. It was poured out so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. You look with me at Romans chapter 4. It was the shedding of God's blood, of Jesus' blood, that ushered in the new covenant. In fact, Jesus uses that term there, Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. The blood of the covenant. In Romans chapter 4 and in verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. All we are indeed a blessed people. For we all, as Paul says in Romans 3 and 23, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 22 of that chapter, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22, the Hebrew writer says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. The law he's talking about is the old covenant. He says Every, almost everything is purified by blood. Now, we've been studying the book of Exodus, and we've studied how many lambs they killed, a lamb in the morning and a lamb at night, to purify. That's what the Hebrew writer is looking back at. He says, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of heavenly things to be purified with those rites. But the heavenly things themselves, with better sacrifice than these, for Christ has entered, entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. You see, the tabernacle under the Old Testament was a picture of the throne room of God. It was a copy of what is in heaven. John, in the book of Revelation, reveals the throne room of God. It says, Jesus did not enter into the tabernacle, but he entered into heaven. Jesus made the shedding of his blood. He says, now the appearing 
in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it offered him was to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by sacrificing himself just as it is appointed for man to die once. After that comes the judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. All friends, we are eagerly waiting the coming of Christ as Christians whose sins are forgiven. We are eagerly awaiting the coming of Christ. And I want, to, I want to talk very briefly about what the bread represents. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26, Jesus says that it represents, he says, this is my body, which is given for you. I want you to consider for just a few moments what his body went through. Now, I don't know if it's humanly possible to go through what Jesus did, but he was human. God in human form, and so therefore it must be possible that he was strong enough to endure the humiliation, the shame, and the anguish. Matthew chapter 27, if you'll go there with me for a moment, and in verse 45, we are now at a, at a time where Jesus is about to be totally humiliated, put to shame. And I think maybe that's harder than the crucifixion itself sometimes is the shame that Jesus bore on our behalf. Matthew 27 verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. There was a full solar eclipse. We can look at our history books and we can see that. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling for Elijah. And one of them ran and took a sponge and filled with sour wine, put it on the end of a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Think of that agony. God mentioned this before. Do you realize that crucifixion is death by suffocation? You don't die from the nails in your hands. You don't die from the nails in your feet. What you do is you die because the strain as you hang there on that cross, the strain from your arms pulls your chest until you cannot breathe. In order to breathe, you have to pull yourself up by your arms and push yourself up by your feet. And yet God chokes he forsake his only son on the cross so that we, we might be called sons and daughters of God. I'll talk for a minute about the blood. I think I've got more on the blood than I have on the body. The fruit of the vine represents Jesus' blood, and rightly so, red. It was something that, they, that was used in the Passover uh, as a memorial for what happened in Egypt and is used in communion. In the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 17 talks about Jesus' blood being what purchased the New Testament. If it weren't for his blood, we would still be under old covenant law. But as it is, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9 and in verse 17, for a will takes effect only at death. 
since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. It was Jesus' blood that made effective the new covenant. That is why in this morning's Bible reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, when Jesus sent out the 72, he said, the kingdom of God is near. It wasn't there yet. It was close. Jesus himself, when he preached, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. He wasn't there. But when the Apostle Paul and the other apostles began to preach after the day of Pentecost, they said the kingdom of God is here. The fruit of the vine it represents the blood, represents Jesus' blood that forgave sins. We read Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. Now I'd like to look at Ephesians chapter 1. For just a moment. We've looked recently at the book of Ephesians. And I want to see this again. Ephesians chapter 1. And in verse 7. The apostle Paul says. In him. Being Jesus. In him we have redemption. Through his blood. The forgiveness of our. Trespasses. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Forgiveness of sins. Life is in the blood. Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. Life is in the blood. The crucifixion, perhaps the most basic fundamental part of our Christian faith, one who gave his life for many. That, that, is, that is the most basic fundamental aspect of Christianity. That we believe that Jesus Christ was willing to suffer and die as a son of God in order to redeem us who were lost. The Christian also must die to him, his, or herself. That means dying to our will, our desires, our wants, our needs, our emotions, and putting Jesus at the forefront of our lives. You will turn with me to Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 20 where the Apostle Paul says this, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. He is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul says, I cannot attain righteousness on my own. And so I attain it through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the crucifixion. Baptism corresponds. Baptism is an entrance into the church, corresponds to the death of Christ. If you'll go back with me for a moment into the book of Romans, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, and in verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Think about that. If death no longer has dominion over Christ, death will no longer have dominion over us. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all 
but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. But the crucifixion, all of this would be worthless. All of this would be meaningless without the resurrection. Without the resurrection, if Christ did not raise from the dead, we wouldn't be remembering his death. We wouldn't be remembering because sin would have won. Satan would have conquered. But as it is, he conquered sin. He conquered death. He lives. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. If it is true, if Paul says it is true that the dead are not raised, but if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is fertile. And you are still in your sins. If Christ did not raise, our faith is worthless. But as it is, he raised. He conquered death. He conquered sin. Do you know what it was that nailed, up, nailed him to that cross? It was our sins. It was our sins. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid that. That we who are dead to sin should live any longer therein. And yet from time to time we do sin. We do fall short of the glory of God. And we live in sin. And yet John tells us that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That we might not live any longer. There's no music to this 